Barbarian are broken! Let's break down D&D 5e with the mighty fury of the Barbarian. I'm pretty sure that everyone at some point or another has at least considered rolling up a big oaf of a character with muscles of steel and all the intellect of a boulder. It's fitting that barbarians are one of the easiest classes for new players to pick up, and it's also a nice break for veteran players that just want to smash stuff for once and ask questions later. You may think all that simplicity makes the barbarian weak, but if you do, you couldn't be more wrong. You've just got to make sure to play to your strengths and constitution, in that order. From there, you may want a decent dexterity, and then wisdom, intelligence, and charisma can fall however you'd like unless there's something you're really going for specifically. Because when used effectively, the barbarian hallmarks can be absolutely devastating for your enemies. They're a key piece of the party dynamic that leaves some pretty big shoes to fill if you don't have one in your playgroup. Usually, this means you'll want to select a species option with big feet. <laughs> like the ones that offer boosts to strength and constitution. So Minotaur, Dwarves, Bugbears, and Goliaths offer great boosts and some savage flavor for most barbarians, but you can always roll up a shredded gnome if you'd like instead. Then at level one, your barbarian will get a D12 hit die, the largest of any class in the game, as well as proficiency in light and medium armor, shields, simple and martial weapons, strength and constitution saving throws, and any two skills from animal handling, athletics, intimidation, nature, perception, and survival. The difference in your staying power compared to the rest of the party will be most apparent at this point when you have nearly double the hit points of most of your companions. But that gets even better as you unlock your rage ability. This bonus action feature is one that you'll be using about as often as you can because it'll grant you advantage on strength checks and saves, extra damage on strength-based melee weapon attacks, and most importantly, resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. That is wildly useful and scales plenty well enough for us in later levels, but it's absolutely nuts at level one when you already have more hit points than anyone else can even fathom. Here's a chart that displays the number of rages you get per long rest and the extra damage you deal with your attacks while raging. There are some downsides, however. In particular, the rage itself only lasts for one minute until you're knocked unconscious or if you end your turn without attacking a hostile creature or taking damage since your last turn. But you weren't going to stop swinging anyway, right? Why would you? I mean, if you have a cool DM, you could even swing on yourself to keep this going. Oh, and you won't be able to concentrate on or cast spells while you rage, but who needs a spell book? You eat those things for breakfast, and for lunch, you'll be eating attacks for the party wizard to make up for it, if your enemy can even touch you in the first place. Because still at just level one, you'll also get your unarmored defense feature, which is way better than the monk's version of this ability, by the way. You'll get an armor class equal to 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your constitution modifier, so long as you aren't wearing armor. And you can still use a shield. Really, it's not uncommon for a barbarian at this point to already have an AC of 18. And even if your enemies do manage to land a hit, you've got resistance and a ton of hit points to spare as you rage on to level two where we go on the offensive. Here, your attacks become reckless, and you can give yourself advantage in exchange for giving your enemies advantage to hit you until the start of your next turn. At first glance, this may seem like a pretty lackluster feature, until you remember that your barbarian has hit points to spare, and they might actually prefer to get knocked around a little bit. You may even want to ditch a shield at this point and try dual wielding just for an extra attack that also benefits from your rage bonus. Or, you know, wield one big weapon because bigger is always better. You'll also get Danger Sense at level 2, an ability that grants you advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see so long as you aren't blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. This will go a long way in avoiding those pesky spells that we don't have resistance against. Yeah. So on that note, let's move on to level three, where we'll choose our Barbarian's Primal Path that'll grant us new features when we choose the subclass, as well as at sixth, 10th, and 14th level. And we'll start off with a fantastic option in the Ancestral Guardian. Barbarians of this variety draw their strength from those who came before, fighting to protect their allies in battle. 
Right away, you'll be able to summon spectral warriors to swarm the first enemy you hit each turn while you're raging, effectively giving them disadvantage on attacks against creatures other than you. Even if they do hit your allies, this ability also gives them resistance to that damage. From there, you can reduce the damage another creature takes as a reaction, cast Augury or Clairvoyance for free once per short rest, and eventually deal force damage to an enemy when you reduce the damage another creature takes. Like I said, this subclass is fantastic. It works more defensively than most might imagine of the Barbarian, but it is extremely effective in reducing damage and debilitating enemies so their sights are always on you and not the squishy casters in the back. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the Battle Rager, a type of barbarian that's technically only available for dwarves unless your DM is okay with changing it up. If you can look past this obvious rules blunder, you'll find a subclass that relies on the use of spiked armor that sort of locks you into wearing only that while also making your unarmored defense feature completely useless. In return, you'll get to make an attack with your bonus action while you're raging to deal 1d4 piercing damage with your spikes, or automatically deal 3 damage to creatures that you grapple. Yeah, that's hardly worth the trade-off here. Later on, you'll get some slightly more useful features like temporary hit points when you reckless attack, a dash bonus action for double movement while raging, and even a retaliatory 3 points of piercing damage anytime you're hit with a melee attack. So really, flavor isn't the problem. The mechanics, on the other hand, leave a lot to be desired, but you might be able to work something out with your DM so you don't have to be a dwarf and you can use whatever armor you like. Suddenly, the subclass wouldn't be all that bad, but as it stands, it's one of the worst available. Next, Path of the Beast Barbarian is a newer option from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that plays into sort of a druidic wild shape flavor for your barbarian. At third level, you can manifest certain features of various animals as strength-based weapon attacks with extra benefits, like a bite that deals 1d8 damage and heals you at the same time, a double claw attack that deals 1d6 damage each, and a spiked tail that deals 1d8 damage and allows you to add a d8 to your AC as a reaction to you being attacked. After that, you'll get features that make you better at climbing, jumping, and swimming, force creatures you hit while raging to make a wisdom save against taking 2d12 psychic damage and attacking another creature of your choice, and finally empower your allies to do an extra d6 of damage once per turn with melee attacks while also giving yourself a heap of temp HP. I honestly don't see many people using this subclass and you might find out why a bit later, but it is a fantastic option for anyone looking for that animalistic flair without an actual druid multiclass. Now we arrive at the Berserker subclass, a barbarian that's likely most akin to what you'd imagine as a poster child for the class. These barbarians are all about violence and fury, so at level 3 when you rage you can choose to take things a step further and make an extra melee weapon attack as a bonus action on each turn after the current one, suffering a level of exhaustion when the rage ends. The mindless bloodlust continues as you'll then become immune to being charmed or frightened while raging, be able to frighten another creature against a wisdom saving throw, and use a reaction to attack a creature that hits you. If anything, I'd say this is a pretty well-balanced subclass with some pretty evocative features. I just talked to your DM about making the wisdom save for your frighten effect reliant on your strength mod rather than your charisma. This brings us to the path of the Giant Barbarian, the newest option from Big B's Glory of the Giants. Barbarians of this variety borrow the strength of giants by drawing on the same elemental powers starting at third level when you can learn either the Druid Craft Cantrip or the Thaumaturgy Cantrip. But more impressively at this level, you'll also grow to large size and increase your reach by 5 feet anytime you rage, and become able to add your extra rage damage to ranged strength-based attacks as well. While these first features might not seem important at first, they'll add up later when you become able to infuse a weapon at the start of a rage so that it deals extra acid, cold, fire, thunder, or lightning damage when it hits. You can even give the weapon the throne property with a cool auto return feature like a giant boomerang. Later, you'll also be able to launch allies and enemies smaller than you up to 30 feet away as a bonus action, and even make yourself huge and increase your reach to 10 feet while raging. You'll have to forgive me for raving on, but I love this subclass in a big way. 
It fits so well with the flavor of Barbarian and its extremely strong mechanics make it one of the best options to choose from. Just imagine your DM's face when you go super and break their encounter by tossing their big bad off a cliff. Yeah. That's happened to me before. Or just toss them 30 feet into the air, let them take 3d6 and fall damage, and then beat them up with advantage when they fall prone in front of you. But now let's move on to the Storm Herald from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. These barbarians channel the power of storms to be as swift as the coursing river, with the force of a great typhoon, with all the strength of a raging fire, and mysterious as the dark side of the moon. When you take the subclass, you'll get to choose from three options for your Storm Aura ability, Desert, Sea, or Tundra. Each corresponds to a set of abilities you'll unlock as you level, and you can change your choice each time you level in case you find something that'll suit you better for your next adventure. The aura itself is a 10-foot sphere centered on you that's activated automatically anytime you rage and can be activated again as a bonus action on each of your turns. To start, it'll give you abilities that'll deal damage or supply temporary HP that scales as you level. Speaking of, you'll later gain resistance to fire, lightning, or cold damage, depending on your choice of aura, eventually be able to extend that resistance to your allies within your aura, and finally gain some additional effects that knock creatures prone, deal extra damage, or drop their speed to zero. Really, this subclass is decent enough, but I can't help but feel that most of what it does is just a cheaper version of the Spirit Guardian spell. This is worth mulling over, but don't let it keep you from fulfilling that badass Raging Storm flavor fantasy, unless you want to break the game with our next entry, the Path of the Totem Warrior, one of the first subclasses introduced in the player's handbook. And yes, it's still the best barbarian subclass in the game. These burly brawlers take on the animalistic qualities of a selected spirit animal out of the bear, eagle, elk, tiger, or wolf for various abilities and added physical attributes to spice up your tinder page. I won't take the time to cover every single option at every single level, but let's have a look at some of my favorites since you can mix and match the spirits you select for each feature. At level three, you're almost always taking Taking the bear totem, which gives you resistance to all damage except psychic while you're raging. That's just nuts, especially if you just so happen to be an amethyst dragonborn with innate resistance to psychic damage. At sixth level, you'll probably end up going with the eagle so that you can see a mile away with no difficulty and see normally in dim light. But the tiger's extra skill proficiencies can be nice too, if you like that. From there, you'll be able to cast the Commune with Nature spell as a ritual, and later select one last totem spirit that'll actually be a pretty tough choice. My personal favorite is the Elk, since it allows you to knock an enemy prone as you run through their space, deal some extra damage in the process, and then beat them up in earnest with advantage afterwards. Make no mistake though, what most people are after here is that bear totem at third level. Resistance to every type of damage is absolutely cracked, especially this early in the game. When you think about it, you're effectively doubling your already massive hit point total, making you nearly impossible to take down. No wonder the Path of the Beast is less often tread. But that's not to say that the Zealot Barbarian isn't a good pick either. This subclass cuts your teeth with a more religious zeal as you follow the gods of war and violence. Third level sees you deal a nice chunk of extra radiant or necrotic damage to the first creature you hit with a weapon each turn and you can be brought back to life without the material components for spells like Revivify or Raise Dead. Your party will thank you for the added savings. From there, you can re-roll a failed saving throw once per rage, inspire up to 10 allies within 60 feet to have advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until your next turn, and even keep fighting while you're at zero hit points so long as you're still raging. Needless to say, this subclass is also powerful, and better yet, it's flavorful. There's no denying the great time you'll have as a zealot. Speaking of fun, the Path of Wild Magic is another newer option that carries some of the same unpredictable antics as its sorcerer companion. To start, you'll gain a surprisingly useful magic detection feature that can pinpoint the location of any spell or magic item within 60 feet of you, and you'll get a special barbarian Wild Magic Surge ability too. Anytime you enter a rage, you'll roll on a D8 random table that determines what wacky effects befall you. 
The table is small, but every option on it is at least useful with entries that give you and your allies plus one to AC, as well as one that summons a pixie that explodes at the end of your turn. From there, you can channel your wild magic into a creature as an action to give them bonuses to attacks and ability checks, or help them regain a spell slot. Roll on the actual wild magic table as a reaction anytime you take damage or fail a save while raging, and make your wild magic rolls twice before choosing which option to unleash. There's no denying that this is a favorite of mine personally. I just love the unpredictability that comes with wild magic. However, even if all the options are good ones, this subclass relies on wild magic rolls even more heavily than its sorcery counterpart. So you just never know what you're going to get and it won't always be useful in your current situation, but you can't stop me from doing it anyway. Just like you can't stop me from using the optional rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that allows us to take an additional proficiency in a base barbarian skill at third level and again later at 10th level. Aside from that, it's time to move on to level four, where we'll get our first ability score improvement or feat. And I usually don't do this, but you should really consider taking Great Weapon Master here, or at least at eighth, 12th, 16th, or 19th level when you get the chance again. This feat, if you're somehow unfamiliar, allows you to make an extra melee weapon attack as a bonus action anytime you crit or drop a creature to zero hit points. But more importantly, it also allows you to take a minus five penalty to hit on an attack with a heavy melee weapon in exchange for an extra 10 damage on the attack. Since your barbarian has reckless attack at this stage, and you probably don't mind getting hit in return, especially if you're a bear totem barbarian, the penalty you get and the advantage you have will effectively cancel and give you a massive boost to your damage output extremely early in the game. And if you think casually slamming enemies with over 20 damage each turn this early is broken, just you wait. It gets even better from here. At fifth level, you'll increase your movement speed by 10 feet so long as you aren't wearing heavy armor and you'll get an extra attack when you take the attack action. And you know what you're doing with that? That's right, reckless attack and great weapon master times two. Then at seventh level, you'll be granted advantage on initiative rolls and become more or less immune to surprise so long as you rage before doing anything else in combat. Optionally, you can also take another feature from Tasha's and move half your movement speed when you start raging. At level nine, Brutal Critical comes online wherein you can roll an additional weapon damage die after you crit with a melee attack with that increasing to two extra dice at 13th level and three extra dice at 17th level. And you can bet that we are still swinging for the fences with great weapon master and reckless attack every chance we get. There's a good chance that you'll be rolling something like four to six D20s per turn this way. And if any of them are a crit, oh boy. <laughs> Level 11 sees you unlock a relentless rage that keeps you up with one hit point so long as you make a DC 10 con save when you fall to zero. Each time afterwards, the DC does increase by five until you short rest, but sometimes you only need to survive one or two more hits to land the final blow. At 15th level, you'll be able to maintain your rage constantly with it only ending if you fall unconscious. Level 18 lets you substitute your strength score for any strength check you make, so uh, yeah, you're never failing gym class again. And then finally, at level 20, your barbarian will automatically have their strength and constitution scores increased by four to a maximum of 24. And just as a reminder, at this point, increasing your constitution by that much is effectively worth 40 hit points all on its own. You are gonna be one tough leather, daddy. Between your resistance to damage, your ability to relentlessly devastate your enemies with big weapons and crits, and the unstoppable nature of your rages, your barbarian will feel so invincible that your DM may actively ignore you on the battlefield in an effort to get after some of the weaker links of your party. Sure, they can try to lock you down with spells, but you can always try taking some other feats like Resilient Wisdom and Lucky to bolster your spell resistance as well. Barbarian may be simple, but it knows what it's all about and it does it to perfection, leaving tons of wiggle room for you to fill in the gaps as you hack and slash your way to victory. On your way, be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons for more guides like this and then go out there and make some chaos.